Hello. Welcome to today's Success Factors Tech Talk. This is an interactive session, so we look forward to hearing your input and answering your questions. Please note, if you are watching today's webinar with a group of colleagues, you will be able to provide a list of additional participants following the presentation. This ensures every attendee will receive a Bentley Learning Unit. I am delighted to introduce Joey Lou Allen today. He is one of our success factor advocates here at Bentley. We also have Dan Ahern, Sherry House, Scott Erbos, and Joe Womanski with us today to assist in Q&A. This 3D modeling pain or gain tech talk will run for about 30 minutes, and we will stay on the line to respond to your questions, so keep them coming. Your phone lines will be muted, but please type your questions in the Q&A box as they come up. We want this to be an interactive session for you and look forward to seeing your questions. Now I'm happy to turn it over to Joey to get us started. All right, thanks, Catherine. Um, give me one second. I will share out my desktop. Um, okay, we should be broadcasting properly, hopefully. Um, so as Catherine mentioned, we want to welcome you all to today's Tech Talk. I want to just uh, also uh, say thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us um, as we kind of talk, as we discuss, and we take a look at three-dimensional modeling, or modeling in 3D, however you like to say it. And, when, and a, the point of this presentation really was just to, uh, we're all becoming more and more familiar with, quote, modeling in 3D. There are questions surrounding that. What does that actually mean? Uh, there are benefits. There are also concerns when it comes to modeling our projects in three dimensions, thus the title, 3D modeling, pain or gain. So let's start taking a look and open up the discussion here. As soon as I can make PowerPoint function properly. All right, a couple of questions as we get started. So really, right off the bat, what do you think? Um, is modeling your projects in three dimension, is it, is it a pain? Is it a gain? What's your experience? Feel free to just type a note in the chat window. Uh, you can put an A or you can put a B as to what you would like to vote for <laughs> when it comes to voting for whether or not it's a pain or it's a gain. And bear with me, I'll be looking. Oh, okay, there we go, I see. So I've got a mixed bag, and this is unscientific, so let me make sure that we all understand. <laughs> this is a bit unscientific. I have uh, A's, I have B's, I don't have a, a, a consensus of one or the other. Um, just my quick perusal. I'm gonna I'm gonna give the B's. Um, I've got an A and a B, an A and a B, and a C. <laughs> uh, I would say I would say we may be about a 60-40 a split on 60 percent, maybe 55 percent. Uh, B's and 40, 45 percent on the A side of the equation. So we're looking maybe half and half, maybe a, a few extra are voting for the gain side of three-dimensional modeling. However, there's still a significant portion of you voting that it's a pain in the neck to model our projects in 3D. So let's take a look and discuss why, how, and what that really means and how we can take advantage of 3D. So with that first question, I have another question. And again, you can just respond in the Q&A box with an A, B, or C. Do you currently model your projects? And uh, I've got a few answers there. A, yes, we model every single project we do within reason. Maybe that's 90%. Maybe that's I'll count that as 100. Or yes, we model it, but only when it's required of us. Or C, no, we never model our projects at all. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment, dropping those in the uh, Q&A box as well. And again, my unscientific methodology of just scanning the responses. <laughs> I'll compile these later. <laughs> all right, thank you all for responding. I'm seeing both uh, A's and B's as, I guess, the predominant answer there. Um, so we've got a split of generally, I guess, from everyone that's voted. There are C's. I see several C's coming in, meaning I don't, we don't really model any of our projects at the moment. 
Uh, also, some extra comments. Thank you all. Uh, good deal. All right. Thanks for the comments. I'm kind of scanning and reading this. Every project gets modeled. We never model any of our projects. Um, and then there's a hybrid answer here as well. We model parts of our project, but not necessarily everything. Uh, so, and okay, yes, we model it when it makes sense. So, I guess the point of these questions, number one, just for my own benefit to kind of understand where everybody happens to be in a practical sense when we discuss modeling our projects in 3D. And as I said, based off the first couple of questions, I'd say uh, this particular quick poll, I would say the majority of you are modeling your projects at some level. Um, that may not be on every project. It may be only on some projects when it's required. And it may be, again, a sort of a hybrid environment where you model certain aspects, certain essential elements um, within your project when you sort of uh, don't see value in modeling other elements, which is sort of, I think, the practical, the reality of where we are when it comes to modeling projects specifically for civil infrastructure. And thus, that was really the point of this presentation, and that's really uh, how this presentation sort of was born. So as we start thinking about three-dimensional modeling, is it painful? Is it gain? What's in it for me kind of question, right? I was thinking through this, and I was kind of, you know, setting up, thinking through the presentation, and it, and it dawned on me, and I guess we all sort of know this, we are visual. Um, we like to see things, to communicate with others, to tell stories, to explain what it is we're talking about, to help us understand what someone else is talking about, uh, generally, we like a show-me type of environment versus a tell-me type of environment. And you know the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Therefore, in the past, we've used many forms for communication, visual representations of things of the earth, whether that is a, a map that you see here from the 1800s, or whether that, that is a topographic map representing elevation changes and highways and topography and environmental uh, features, whether that's a, a plat of a subdivision or a right-of-way map defining property boundaries, or whether that's a construction document, a plan and profile sheet, for example. Again, the point is we're all visual. We like to see what's going on so that we can interpret it, so that we can analyze it, we can understand it. And so really that's kind of the discussion point for three-dimensional models. Three-dimensional models are really a souped up or an enhanced way of visualizing our projects, visualizing and understanding and communicating and really analyzing our projects. And you all have seen imagery of three-dimensional design models and so forth. But that's really the context, again, as I thought about it, just to kick things off is, is really where I'm starting. Modeling in 3D is a, a better way to show and to explain and to analyze and really to clarify what our design intent is um, to others. But it's not completely about others. And I think that's an important point for us to realize as, as we talk and present and we look at this topic for ourselves. As designers, as engineers, um, modeling in three dimensions has benefits for us as well. As we're working through a design process, those uh, three dimensional data and the interaction of that data has benefit for us as well. Now, as we discussed last month, we focused on the, the magic three-letter term BIM. Um, BIM is really based off of a three-dimensional model of our projects. Now, the debate can go on and on as to what that model actually is. We're all familiar with terrain models. Terrain models that you see on the screen have been around for decades. They have been the default, quote, three-dimensional model that we've all used throughout our uh, career in, in working in the civil industry, right? We've all created break lines and triangles and generated terrain models in the form of DTMs or TINs or whatever it may be. But again, it's triangulated data based off three-dimensional line work. Now, to take this all a step farther, we need to evolve a little beyond terrain models. Our modeling capabilities with Open Roads Designer have gone beyond terrain models so that we can model, in addition to terrain models, we can model solids. We can model pavement layers, curb and gutter sections, sidewalks, ramps, uh, cut and fill slopes. We can add depth to the model. 
which again has value and has benefit to us. We just need to think about and begin to look at how we can extract that value out when it comes to modeling our projects, okay? And so in looking at three-dimensional modeling, and again, there's three-dimensional modeling for all phases of a project, but I'm focusing on three-dimensional modeling for the designers, for us as uh, consultants, as engineers. What are our benefits for modeling our projects? As I mentioned before, we're visual. It just allows us to see the interaction of the elements. It allows us to see what it is we're proposing to construct. Helps us reduce errors and emissions because we can see it. We can see the cross slope on the road. We could see the interaction of the rim elevation of the manhole related to the cross slope of the pavement. And it gives us ultimately an increased clarity of our design. Helps us reduce conflicts. And then the big one helps us minimize and reduce change orders. Who likes change orders on the call? Anybody? <laughs> I didn't make that a poll question because I know what the answer is. <laughs> so the point really is that the benefits of modeling are we can see it. We can analyze it. We can evaluate it as a designer in-house while we are making engineering decisions. There's even benefit to quantities. Um, downstream. How can we take advantage of this data to better quantify our projects, okay? So there are multiple benefits or pros to modeling our projects in three dimensions. Now, the question becomes, if I can minimize the change orders that may impact me throughout my well, any project for that matter, if I can reduce errors and emissions, if I can see the results of my proposed design intent, if I can analyze the area where the bridge deck meets my pavement section and analyze the cross slopes and make sure there are no uh, elevation busts between those, why don't I model all my projects? We've talked about their benefits, there's pros. Wow, why don't I, why don't I model all of my projects? So here's another quick question. Which of the options, and I, I got a little carried away, I used A through K on these, and you can have multiple answers, but which of these present the biggest hurdle to implementing three-dimensional modeling based off your opinion? And you could have multiple answers, and I'll give you just a second to respond in the Q&A box if you don't mind. Um, thanks, everybody. Yep, feel free. Keep responding, please. I'm seeing uh, E, B, uh, E, the requirement is still construction documents, a valid point there. The requirements are still construction docs. Uh, B, I don't know how to model the project. Um, I'm seeing J, file size and processing speed doesn't necessarily allow me or isn't conducive to me modeling all this data. Um, I see I, H. Delivery methods and protocols haven't been specified. H is the level of detail required isn't clear as well. Um, just give me a moment to browse through here. A, F, and G, it's different. Uh, extra training is required, and standards are not well defined. Wow, getting all kinds of answers. Great. Thank you all for joining and just jumping in with the responses. This is a tech talk, so... <laughs> Um, I'm open to talk. Um, D, it's a little benefit to me and a lot of extra work. Valid question, valid point there. Um, so I've seen most of these pointed out by different people throughout the, I'm looking through the list. Uh, I think I've seen every letter mentioned by someone through the entire session. So uh, companies reluctant to do it. Um, corporations reluctant to involve or invest in doing it. It's an unknown. It's a new technology. Um, traditional workflows. We still have traditional ways of doing things. Um, we still have traditional deliverables. We have legalities that we have to consider as well. That, that's being pointed out in the comments as well. There are legalities we have to understand uh, how those can be 
handled in an environment? Is the digital data the legal document by which I, as a professional engineer, am held liable? That's the question, right? So there are multiple questions about three-dimensional modeling. They can be viewed as, as drawbacks or cons, or they can be viewed as opportunities. And really the objective or the point, I guess, I, I'm looking at here and I'm looking through this and I recognize that every one of these uh, points represent hurdles, represent questions in my mind as a, as a designer. Um, if I am going to model my project in three dimensions, these are all valid questions that I have as to what does that mean? What kind of model? How much do I model? What technology do I use to model? boy, that looks really hard, and I, I don't know if I have time to do it, and who's getting the benefit for it? Am I going to be sued because I didn't do something properly in this digital data format that I'm going to provide? So there are multiple questions as it, come, or as it relates to modeling our projects in 3D, okay? And I think we recognize, I, anyway, I recognize all of those, and they are prevalent, I guess, when it comes to this topic and thinking about it. There are benefits, though, looking at 3D modeling specific for the designers. Now, there are considerations when it comes to looking at modeling in 3D, and I've begun to call it authoring the model. In the past, we've authored construction documents. We've produced construction drawings. So this is the same. We're authoring a design model. This is Joey's terminology, but <laughs> we are authoring this design model. And we need to think about those considerations when it comes to the model. What's my design intent? What am I trying to uh, propose here as the design? What's the cross slope? What's the super transition rate? Um, what's the elevation of the invert of this particular inlet? All those things go into play in defining and building this model. Level of detail, again, that is a practical, real-world consideration. How much do I model? Do I model the ADA ramp? Does that have value? Is it worth the time? Do I model things like stop signs? Do I include those? Do I include striping? Do I include joints in the retaining wall, for, for that matter? Do I, you know, expansion joints along a curb and gutter section? Should I model that? And these are all valid questions that go into play in definition of and consideration of the level of detail when it comes to modeling. Also, thinking about the standards for delivery. What do we deliver this? How does it look like? What does it look like? What file format? Is it multiple files? Is it a single file? What's included in the file? And then tools, techniques, and workflows. Again, important considerations when it comes to authoring the model. What do I use and how do I use it to build the model? And then ultimately, we all, we all want to know the requirements. Tell me what's expected of me and I will produce it, correct? Now, in the past when we talked about 3D, um, this was my perspective. When we talked about 3D in the past and we talked about modeling, again, we're all familiar with terrain models. And terrain models are a three-dimensional model. They are three-dimensional break lines and points with triangles interconnecting them all in a three-dimensional space. But as we thought about 3D in the past, we might have let, might let our mind into, oh, okay, 3D modeling, that's, that's visualization. That's, let, give me a grand picture of the project and let me create an animation while I fly around the project and I'll use that at a public hearing. But in today's technology, with Open Roads Designer, the real benefit of 3D is now relevant to us as designers because the details are being included. The details are being modeled. The inlets are being modeled to a level we've never been able to model them. The elevations, the X's and the Y's and the Z's are all geospatially correct. The interaction of bridges, the piers, the piles, uh, the footings in relationship to the roadways and other elements are all interactive and, and can, we can see how they work together. So the details now within modeling are all relevant and relative, meaning we get value out of it as designers because we care about the details. And really that's where Open Roads Designer kind of comes into the picture. And uh, you'll see here I call it Open Roads Designer Modeling Simplified. 
So I want to take just a moment and, and we'll take a look at some of the enhancements involved in Open Roads Designer and some of the fundamental principles um, included in Open Roads Designer that makes modeling simplified. Now, just step back for a minute and think about how we do things today. We work in a plan, we work in a profile, and we work in a cross section, right? We've got a horizontal alignment in our plan view defining the X's and the Y's of an alignment or an edge of pavement or a curb return, whatever that may be. Then we supplement that horizontal layout with a profile, a two-dimensional profile, a profile based off of stations and elevations. That's where we incorporate the Z. So we've got a 2D horizontal. We add to it a 2D profile giving us stations along that particular alignment and elevations. And what do we get? We end up with a three-dimensional line. And this is the basic principle employed in Open Roads Designer for modeling. We've got a horizontal element defined, well, which has a profile defined on it. If that equals 3D. And in Open Roads Designer, the idea that we have to model and draw and interact to create design elements in 3D is not true. 3D in Open Roads Designer is a byproduct. And I spelled designer wrong, so please don't <laughs> forgive me for that. Open, the 3D in Open Roads Designer is a byproduct of your traditional horizontal and vertical workflows. Okay, so the idea that we have to get into the 3D model and begin to draw 3D lines um, is not the way we, it works in Open Roads Designer. So let's take a look. So I want to start out and, and I want to just again think about 3D modeling and what's the benefit to us as designers. I'm in a two-dimensional file. Okay, there's nothing special about this DGN. It is a 2D drawing file. And you can see at the top center, it's a 2D DGN. I've referenced in the, the basic data that I'm going to need. The terrain model's been referenced. Um, the geometry for the horizontal alignments have been referenced, as well as the geometry for the edges of pavement and some control geometry, including the right-of-way, has all been referenced and compiled as well. Now, thinking about our traditional workflow, we've got the horizontal alignment displayed. Here, I'm opening up the profile, the vertical alignment, associated with that horizontal alignment. And we can see that here on the screen right before us. So we now have, again, in the 2D file, I have the horizontal plus the vertical. Ultimately, what happens? So we're going to build a corridor. This is nothing more than just a typical workflow uh, we're going to build a corridor along the eastbound road, SR97, that you see on the screen. So to have a corridor, we need the horizontal defined and we need the profile defined. And so now we're just going to select that element and open up the corridor dialog box and create the corridor. So I'll follow the prompts. We've seen the profile defined in the window below. Again, I'm just stepping through the prompts in Open Roads Designer. And we'll click through the buttons. I'll select the template that I want to use, the typical section that's going to define uh, the, the section of my roadway. I'll just grab this four-lane divided section on the screen, select OK to that, and then data point through the prompts. I'll select the starting station and an ending station for the length that I want to model my roadway. Okay, And then I'll define the drop interval. We'll just set that to 10. Now, I haven't touched 3D at this point at all. That's the, the key I want to kind of point out here is that I have not touched 3D at all. Now, I've data point, the uh, corridor is being processed, and now I see the results of that corridor in, the, in a plan view, in that 2D model view. And I'll just jump up to my cross sections, or not my cross sections, in my plan view, and I'm going to turn off um, some references. And mistakenly, I turned off too many references, so bear with me here while I correct this. Uh, select those. I want to see the geometry, so I'll turn those back on. All right, so now uh, we can see the linear results of, uh, of our roadway corridor that we just processed. 
we see the ditches, we see the extents, um, the catch points along the roadway corridor on the north side and the south side. So now we've run that corridor, we've dropped the templates along it, and we've generated that corridor, all those linear elements. Okay. Now, I can look at those elements. If I hover over those, we can see the inside edge or the edge of the shoulder or the flow line of the median ditch. All that now is just visible in the two-dimensional, in the planned view for me. Okay? So there is, again, just a roadway corridor, quickly created. Now, <clears throat> if I select that corridor, another way we typically interpret our data is in a cross-section view. So I'm going to go and open up a cross-section view of, of the project. So I'll just open up the cross-sections of this corridor in an additional view. And now we see the representation of our corridor. You'll notice I'm at the beginning of the corridor on the far western side. And I'm just going to jump closer to that central area where you see the uh, interchange or the overpass. Uh, and that's where we're going to focus our effort. So let's pull on in and let's jump the cross sections up into that area a little bit. And now we see the results of that corridor that we created. So at this point, I've seen geometric layout in two dimensions. I've looked at the profile files associated with those 2D alignments, and now I'm looking at the cross-sections represented by the corridor we just created. Now, with those sections, I can, again, I can move around and jump forward or jump back, backwards to interpret the corridor and understand what's going on there, okay? Now, taking a step forward just a little bit, now, as I said, we're going to focus in on this area where we're going to implement an overpass. Okay, so if we look at that central area and we go out to our references, I'm going to reference in the north-south road for London Road, and I'm just referencing in a corridor that was pre-built. Now, we have an east-west corridor, SR97, and we have a north-south corridor called London Road referenced together. Again, I haven't, um, I haven't done anything. I'm working in my 2D DGN. I can see the profile view. I can see the cross-section view. And now if, if I jump forward with cross-section view to that overpass area, you'll notice that now in the cross-sections, I'm seeing SR97 as well as London Road at grade passing underneath it. So we can see all of those elements now within that cross-section view. Again, it's really about interpreting the data. Okay? And again, oh, you know, our discussion today is all about 3D. But remember with Open Roads Designer, we wanted to allow you to work traditionally to analyze and interrogate and create data traditionally in horizontals and profiles and understanding in cross-sections, the 3D data. Now here I'm just going to open up multiple views. And if in the look in the top right corner, you'll notice that that three-dimensional data is present. That 3D model of SR97 along with London Road via the referencing is all present. Um, I didn't move to the 3D file to create it. Um, I didn't draw anything in the 3D file to generate it. It is inherent. It is a byproduct of my workflows in that 2D view, in the profile view, okay? So the point here of this really for, for Open Roads Designer is just to hopefully point out that three-dimensional modeling with Open Roads Designer is easier than you think, in that we have built Open Roads Designer to, to model things in three dimensions really as a byproduct of your traditional workflows, okay? We would, to make things easier, let's look at modeling modeling in our traditional workflows. Now, let's take this model a step farther. As I said, we've got this area crossing over London Road. We need to implement, we need to put some bridges over that. We need to talk about abutment walls. What are we going to do? Okay. Now, the real benefit of 3D modeling, as I mentioned, our perspective on 3D modeling in the past was grand overall project view. Let's see the project from beginning to end, and let's see this grand vision. Well, that has limited value to me as a designer. I need to see some details. I need to get into these tight areas where I've got footings and piles and piers and abutments and sound walls and retaining walls, all this stuff interacting. And that's where the value of 3D is really found. 
So that's why I picked this area of uh, this overpass so that we can look at. Well, let's look at the details because that's really where three-dimensional modeling's value lies. So we're going to uh, clip out this area. Again, again, I'm working in the 2D view, but pay attention to the 3D view. I'm going to use the clipping tools. That shape was pre-drawn, and I'm just going to use that to remove the area of the corridor passing over London Road. And so simply by using the tools, uh, adding that clipping plane or that clipping shape to my corridor, I have now removed that area of SR-97 over London Road. You can see the shape there. You can see the pavement. You can see the details of the model that's been generated for SR-97. Okay? And so now I've just clipped it out. And now at this point, really, I've got a pretty good 3D model, um, especially if you think about the way we've done things in the past. This is a, this is a well-refined, a detailed uh, model with pavement layers, shoulders, and so forth. So we've clipped out that, that area. Uh, we can see in the cross-section view there below, and these are uh, dynamic model sections. These are evaluation sections that allow me, as a designer, to evaluate the engineering of my data. Okay? These are, again, analysis-type cross-sections that let me look at these elements in a cross-sectional view so that I can consume them, interpret them, analyze them, um, and make better decisions about them. So we've clipped out that boundary. Uh, we've clipped out that area. And now what? What do we need to do now? We need, I need something. I need a structure there. <laughs> now how, what's next? I need to be able to, to incorporate a bridge model. I need to be able to incorporate and really take the value, extract the value of this 3D model. Um, so you'll notice there are a couple of lines drawn in there, and those are just my pre-built uh, retaining wall profiles. And we'll look at those in more depth in just a second. But uh, those represent the top of what will be the abutment walls. Now, as I said, I'm going to incorporate the bridge models. So I have taken my open roads um, alignments, my PGL, my horizontal alignment, my typical section, my, my pavement widths, and so forth, provided that to the bridge section. And then they have modeled my bridges in Open Bridge Modeler. And I'm just going to reference those in uh, into my project. So I'll go out. I've selected a couple of uh, the bridge models, an eastbound and a westbound uh, model. And again, these were modeled in Open Bridge Modeler using my Open Roads Designer geometry. And so I've just re referenced those in. They were created geospatially correct and, of course, elevationally or based off the PGL. Now, interacting with that 3D data at this point, I've done nothing special other than reference those files in. And I referenced them to the 2D drawing. And now look at the three-dimensional model that gives me a level of detail that I never had before. And again, it's really about decision making. It's about being able to understand this data um, for designers, right? It's, it's about designers. What benefit can I extract from this 3D data? I can see that uh, bridge deck. I can see the beams underneath it in the cross-section view. And one of the simple things I might want to do is just check clearance real quick. So if I wanted to just do a quick measurement of the clearance, between the, uh, the beams and the roadway surface underneath. I could do that just by using microstation measuring tools if I wanted. So, so we could click through here. Um, we go up, hit the measure button, go down. We'll click a snap button and just place a quick measurement underneath, underneath the roadway to just do a quick check. So again, just snapping a quick measurement to the top of the road. Pull that over and then pull that up. And I'm a little bit out of alignment there, so let's try this once again. Let's zoom in. Uh, again, let's snap that to the top of the road, the London Road surface, and pull that up. Oh, I did it again. I'm a little click happy today. <laughs> so let's try this once again. I think you get the picture, though. <laughs> so that cross section view is legitimate for engineering precision, for measurement, for those type of evaluations that we would want to perform in terms of making decisions for our design. 
So we've measured that distance for just a quick clearance, and we see we're at 21 feet, almost 22 feet um, of clearance, which also indicates that we have the opportunity to lower that PGL for SR97 a little bit. So we've got a few feet there. We could lower that thing down, save on some earthwork as well. Okay? And again, that's just a quick check based off the in integration of that, uh, of that data into one place in Open Roads Designer and then using the tools just to check and to validate it. All right? So we've implemented or included now the, uh, the bridge model. We can see that uh, within, within the overall model. We've looked at the clearance, just doing a quick check between the bridge and the roadway surface. Again, one of the real benefits of 3D is just being able to see. So, you know, I want to check. I'll zoom into the area where the bridge deck meets my cross section, my paving on my roadway, and just by visually inspecting it, I can see I have a discrepancy between the elevations and the slope of the bridge deck um, with my particular roadway surface. And this is one of those common um, areas where we always have discrepancies. So just by being able to implement this data, or really combining this data in one place, it gives us that opportunity um, to just do some checks, to just get some visual, visual feedback, um, verify that things are the way they're supposed to be, um, and if not, we can go and take corrective action to, to remedy that, okay? So we've got the bridges in there. We can rotate the view and spin the view. And I think, again, for us, the point I guess I'm really trying to make is that there is a lot of value to be extra extracted out of modeling in three dimensions. And with Open Roads Designer, our intention was to make modeling easier, to make it less complicated, less cumbersome, less time consuming. Okay? Now, in doing that, I've jumped here into another drawing. Um, and so one of the things we may want to think about when it comes to modeling the abutment walls. Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to lay out these walls along either end of the bridges on the west side and the east side. I have an alignment defined representing how the uh, abutment wall is going to be built and going to be displayed. You can see that in the 2D view on the left, and you can see it on the 3D view in the right, uh, indicating that there's a profile defined for it. Now, Figuring out if the top of my abutment wall is going to clash or conflict with the top of the beams in the 3D view is a bit difficult. So how can I confirm that my proposed top of the wall elevation um, will work with the bottom of the beam designed from the bridge section? How can I verify that the two won't conflict with one another? And that's what we're looking at here. So I see that 3D line. That represents, again, the top of the wall based off of a profile that I've defined associated with the horizontal element. Okay. Now, again, how do I see the interaction of that top of wall with the beams of the bridge? If I try and do this in three dimensions, that seems a little tedious, and it looks a little difficult for me to check that clearance. right? I could, I could pan and zoom and rotate and snap and click, but that's a little difficult for me to interpret. Thus, the need to be able to look at drawings like cross-section views and profile views and to be able to manage those views so that we can interpret and analyze that data effectively. Right? So what we are going to do is to take uh, and open up a profile view so that we can see the profile represented by the top of our wall. I'll just pan over, select the profile model window, uh, open up an additional view, and then click in it to place the profile. And I'm going to move that over. I'll adjust the view just a little bit. And now you can see the profile. This is the station and elevation along that layout for the abutment wall. Right, and that is the definition, the plan view layout plus this profile equals the 3D line that you see on the right-hand side. Okay, but again, the question is, for engineering's sake, for decision-making, does the top of my proposed wall conflict with the bottom of the beams of this proposed bridge model? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this Create 3D Cut tool, and it's all about 
maximizing the value of the data with Open Roads Designer. So in that profile view, I'm just going to open up a window into the three-dimensional model. So let's click one corner, then pull it over and click another corner. So I'm just going to drag that window over, and now that's given me window into the three-dimensional model in my profile designed of my abutment wall. And so now I'm able to make those decisions. I'm able to see this relevant data in a nice uh, perspective that I can easily understand. So I can see clearly that my proposed top of wall gives enough clearance to the bridge beams. Okay? I could look at the left and right adjustments. I can see that uh, potentially my wall elevation on the right-hand side may have a conflict point with the uh, bridge deck. Okay? But the point of all of this is to understand that interpreting and using this 3D data for design analysis to help you minimize uh, these errors and change orders and the things that come along is really the intention behind what we're doing. All right? So again, we just opened up. I moved to another file to do that so we could see that interaction. We've confirmed now that the top of our abutment wall gave us enough clearance underneath the bridge deck, okay? And so now what we want to do is we want to take a step farther. We want to model these abutment walls, okay? So again, maximizing the value of the 3D to me is most uh, effective. The most value is extracted when we get in these areas that there are potential for a lot of conflicts. So we can understand. Uh, the details matter, right? <laughs> and the modeling capabilities uh, allow us to model and incorporate and integrate all those details. So here, I've moved back into my corridor, my model for SR97 and for this uh, overpass. We see the 3D line. As I said, we've confirmed that that elevation underneath the bridge deck works for us. And now I'm going to generate the abutment wall. And I'm going to use that 2D plan view, uh, 2D alignment with the profile view that's defined. And I'm going to build an additional corridor incorporating a retaining wall. So I'll click that, select the retaining wall section that I want to use, data point through the prompt saying I want to, I want to run this wall from the start of my horizontal wall, uh, abutment wall alignment to the end. I want the interval to be tight. I want to, I'm going to set that to one because I want a nice, neat, clean model of this abutment wall. And then I'll process it. And so now, using corridors, uh, the same type of corridor mentality you would have used or we used when we modeled the four-lane roadway, I now have a pretty good model going. I've got a model now incorporating that four-lane road. I've got the abutment walls models. I've got the bridges referenced in in place. And now I can see the interaction of this data. And I haven't worked in 3D um, very much at all. I mean, other than as an analysis uh, a feedback type of window so that I can view, I can rotate, I could snap to elements to check elevations and so forth, okay? Now here I can see an area where my guardrail seems to be uh, extending past where I want it to extend. So that would be a change I could implement. I could back that thing up six feet or eight feet. I could turn it around for that matter and, and, and realign it so that it's coming onto the bridge deck. Now I can change the views as well so we could just, if you want to look at things in a different way. Uh, I'll just change the mode to transparent. And again, all those conflict points always occur in some area that is difficult to interpret. Always and difficult to interpret when we did things in plans, uh, when we had disparate data in different places or different sheets throughout the plan set or different disciplines and totally different sets. How do we uh, bring those together and let that data coincide? Now we're going to go I've opened up the profile along the other side, the ahead side of our, our uh, bridge. And we're just going to model that abutment wall as well. Same process as we used on the western side. Just create the corridor. I'll use the same template that was used previously. And then we'll follow the prompts and create that uh, from beginning to end. And now we see it on the other side. And so, again, we can rotate the view, take a look at the details of the model. And again, we're just building or authoring this model. And we are trying, and ultimately the point is, again, to, to author the model and extract value from it.
So we can rotate that, take a quick look at it, and again, ultimately, uh, use it for decision making. All right? So again, we went through a fairly quick example, and we created a fairly, a quite robust model of an area where uh, conflicts and problems tend to arise. You know, not just a roadway corridor, not just a two-lane or a four-lane. Uh, it is an area where we have multiple elements coming together, and we were able to produce that in three dimensions in a fairly short amount of time using typical workflows and thought processes that we have done, used in the past. So back to 3D modeling. Is it a pain or is it a gain? There are uh, multiple examples where 3D has a positive impact. The difficulty that always arises when we talk about three-dimensional modeling is the how. How do I model it? It's too hard. Can the technology support me modeling these projects in a way that's efficient and effective? Right? That's the, that's the sticking point when it comes to really taking advantage of 3D modeling these days in, in civil infrastructure. And again, with Open Roads Designer, the objective is to make creating, authoring, generating, analyzing, and maximizing the value of that 3D data much more efficient and much easier. So the benefits of 3D modeling, assuming that uh, the, the modeling tools, technology, and techniques make life easier, I have produced that data, that 3D model gives me the opportunity to visually analyze what's going on. I can check cross slopes. I can check elevations. I can see interaction of pieces and parts. Site distance is readily available in the 3D world. Um, I can model and look at walls, how walls interact with uh, my roadway surface, for example. Utilities. Utilities always tend to be a problem on construction projects. Number one, we don't know where they're located with any precision. Number two, generally when we give a guesstimate of where they're located, it's usually on a sketched out, you know, ballpark type of plan drawing, three feet below the surface, about 15 feet from the edge of pavement, the right of way, or whatever it is. So modeling utilities in three dimensions gives us the opportunity to check for conflict points. Of course, assuming that that data that we have for modeling that data in three dimensions is valid. Right, We can guess where it is in 3D and still be wrong. <laughs> so, But it gives us the opportunity to save a lot of hassles, headaches, dollars, and time wasted when we have conflicts on utilities when construction begins. Uh, taking advantage of drainage structures, again, checking elevations, validating slopes, coordinating data between disciplines, between structures, between bridges, between geotechnical data. We can display that in three dimensions as well. Again, coordination of data in three dimensions just gives us a world of um, better information so that we can make better decisions, and then quantities as well. We are working um, and enhancing Open Roads Designer continually to take advantage of three-dimensional data for quantities, including earthwork. So more benefits for the designer in modeling in 3D. Why you want to consider modeling in 3D? To reduce those errors, those emissions, to, to just check the engineering, reduce conflicts, reduce those change orders that we don't like to deal with or hear about, um, to evaluate drainage structures. Design analysis is more direct. Pardon my typing. <laughs> Coordination of disciplines and in better quantities. So I did have bonus material, but I know I have gone a bit longer than expected, so uh, I'll stop right there. And uh, we'll field some questions along the way. If you happen to have any questions, please. Um, I don't know if we've been answering questions along the way or not. Um, so give me one second. If you have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat window, and um, we'll respond to those. I assume um, Joe, Scott, Dan, Sherry, uh, Tim have been answering questions throughout the session, I assume. But if you have questions or any that we need to respond to, please place them in the chat window, and we will uh, do our best to respond. And I'm now browsing down to look at the question, so bear with me while, while I catch up. Someone was asking about um, 3D cells for head walls. I believe that, that you can do that in SUDA, isn't that correct? 
Right, right. I didn't. I didn't include any demonstration of, of the drainage structures or utilities, but the, the structures, when you use the subsurface utility tools, um, those are three-dimensional cells, basically, for headwalls, for inlets, for manholes, whatever the structure might be. Does that answer the question? I think it does. Um, yeah, and if we're not clear on, on anything that we may have responded to or we may respond to, to right now, um, just please let me know. There's another question here about the quantities from the model that we clipped out there. Someone's asking, I said, what's the benefit of generating quantities in ORD if the quantities tool doesn't factor in corridor clips and breaks and template drops? Okay. I don't know if that's necessarily that's not really true, is it? I mean, what you're looking at on the screen would be your true quantities right there. Um, is that not, right. Is that not that, correct? Right. right. Yeah, that that's right. Is Joe still on the? Joe could jump in. The yeah. the image that you see on the screen, and I I did this to. Uh... Okay, so Joe's back. I think we need to be clear that the quantities are being pulled from the 3D mesh that you see on the screen. So Correct. That, that's right. So, um, and Joe can jump in and comment too if you're, if you're available in chat. But um, the quantities, and, and you see the image on my screen, I, this was the bonus I, I ran. Um, I just ran the cut and fill volumes, which generates a 3D earthwork model based off of the model that we created. And you'll notice that it does create the 3D, and it clips out that area of the corridor where we extracted. Um, just let that run around. Where we we clipped out the you know the SR97 corridor. So it is honoring the clips. And now if I well I'll rotate the view here in just a second. Um, so it is honoring the clips there. And there may be. Uh, let's see. Yep, so we should be honoring those that data. It's all based off the 3D. And so I guess that's I guess that's really the point here is that the quantities are based off the 3D and this earthwork, the cut and fill tool does honor the clips. Okay? Is there something specific? Maybe there's a specific report um, that's been referred to or it's an enhancement that we've incorporated recently in the past couple of builds um, that may not, you may not have, we may not have had previously. Does that cover that one? What's that? Are we doing any? Are we doing anything on Suda late uh, anytime soon? Someone's asking, can you give us a training soon on Su 3D modeling? So I guess they're looking for subsurface utility modeling. We have. Are you doing anything? Um, we do. We've got a, a tech talk scheduled on 3D. Uh, subsurface utilities, and I don't remember the month. Um, I'm going to say it's October-ish time frame. I'm not sure of the date, but we do have that scheduled, so be watching for that. It is scheduled. The presenter is lined up, and uh, that will be on the calendar and upcoming very soon. All right? I think it – I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's October, but I'd have to check the calendar to be absolutely sure on that one. But it is scheduled, so be looking for it. Um, let's see. We've got another one here. It's about the clip boundaries. Is there a way to verify that the clip boundaries are consistent with the references? For instance, if the bridge extends an additional five feet, is there a way to verify the clip boundary is still applicable or needs to be adjusted? Seems like the only check is visually. Well, I suppose if you made the clip boundary ruled to one of the corridors, would that maybe... Uh, Help with that? Well, yeah, that that seems. Or maybe, right. or maybe ruled it, or maybe ruled it to the bridge, possibly. I don't know. Yeah, I think what you'd want to do there. I was thinking ruling it to the bridge, possibly. Right, right. I we'd have to take advantage of. Um, yeah, Joe, Joe says rule the clip to the bridge, which is what I was thinking too. Right. You'd have, and I didn't cover that in the presentation, but when we created the clip boundary itself. Um, you could actually yeah. build that and rule it to to the bridge itself, so it would know. 
Um, Did we rule that thing to the alignment too? To, can't remember if we ruled it to the alignment or an offset alignment of that abutment. That way, when no, we move the adjusted the abutment. Yeah, I can't remember. This one doesn't have the relationship. It does not. So we need to have we need to have another presentation about to rule or not to rule, right? That's right. That's, that is the question: to rule or not. That'll, to rule. that'll be an, that'll be another presentation for another day: to rule or not to uh, rule. Open roads rules. <laughs> uh, so there is a way to maintain that relationship. It involves again using the the rules and relationships captured when you lay out that shape as a. You'd have to build it as an open road geometric element to rule it. Um, I need a next question about: Is there any videos available for creating head walls, slope walls, um, bridge cones, and slide, or embankments? Um, there are. And Scott, you might could chime in if you know any specific courses off the top of your head. Um, we don't have any courses that do that yet. It's on my list of things to do. Um, I think Joe had a video out there somewhere in one of his corridor presentations where he shows how to do a little slope wraparound kind of thing. Um, I think that was in like one of the best practice corridor presentations for the LEARN conference. If you go back and take a look at that on the LEARN server, I think he had an example of how to do that fairly quickly. Okay. Gotcha. That's the only like official like video I've seen of that. I mean, I have stuff that I've done, but nothing's documented yet. I got it. Okay. It's on my list. We'll get there. All right. And Joe, um, uh, there's more questions on quantities, and it relates to to clips. There may be different. Can you comment, Joe? Um, I mean, there's questions about the earthwork is honoring the clip. I mean, I see that. That's on the screen. Um, so clearly that cut and fill shapes that we're creating there are based, well, anyway, they're being based in, in ignoring or removing that clipped area. I think, I think there's some confusion here, too, because I see people talking about SS4, and the functionality between SS4 with the clipping and everything is a little bit different, how that's handled now, correct? Since the earthwork's now pulling directly from those meshes and everything. Right, and there's also um, discussion about pavement quantities versus earthwork. Um, so we've got different versions and, you know, a couple of different, I guess, elements that we're trying to extract from it as well. I see yeah. someone here saying they're using Geopack SS4. Well, the functionality in there is a little bit different. Right. From SS4 to where we are now, there have been a multitude of enhancements into Open Roads Designer. Um, so I think that's that's important to point out too. From Select Series 4 to Open Roads Designer, we, we have implemented quite a few enhancements. Um, Joe may be tied up at the moment. So I guess we need some clarification on, on number one. Uh, between SS4 now to Open Roads Designer, also specific elements that we're trying to quantify. Pavement component quantities versus um, versus earthwork versus anything else. So the question would be, and I can test this. So so give me, I'll follow up with this on, on this question because we just need to check. So if I did a components report. Uh, Component Joey. quantities. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. There's, there's Joe. Right, okay, I finally got audio. I did crash uh, Adobe during the presentation. Sorry. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, we had several questions related to quantities and whether or not they are they honor clips or not. And so the the several questions that we're seeing: number one, earthwork we can see um, honors the, the clipping. Uh, pop that back up. So we can see that, that the earthwork, the 3D cut and fills are honoring the clipping plane. Does that extend to component quantities as far as honoring the clips? And have we enhanced that, that type of stuff from SS4 to open the 3D design? model would work. It's the um, old um, component quantities from the corridor tool that we used to have in Select Series 2, going to 3, 4. That didn't honor clips, and that's why we have the note in the bottom of that dialog saying clips are not honored. All these new tools will honor the clip um, and what's in the actual 3D model. Okay. So, so bottom line, what we're seeing then is a difference between Select Series 4 and Open Roads Designer. We've, in, we've in, implemented those 
enhancements in Open Roads Designer so that quantities are based off the 3D data, clip or no clip. And with this last release, we, we do take in on a suitable, uh, we're working on currently on, on suitable materials being calculated and split with uh, remove and replace versus just removed um, in the next update. However, the cut fill will take into account of the uh, unsuitable and cut and fill shapes that are created, the blue and red meshes that you see there um, currently in this release will um, take account the unsuitable material if they are present in the 3D, uh, the 3D model itself. Okay. Awesome. And I Thanks, think that's Joe. I think you have slated on uh, the agenda for a future presentation there, right, Joey? That's right. Yes. That is exa that's that's exactly right. Yep. And, and I'm open. You know, if you have comments or suggestions for presentations too, please drop those in the Q and A box. I'm open to taking those. And we have uh, we've gone past the hour. I've. <laughs> uh, let's take one more question. We've about got all. Well, I think we've just about got all of them actually. Um, uh, bear with me here. I'm trying to see. Uh, why can't I use the bridge itself as a clip? You could. Uh, I guess you could. You could, but it's probably not going to be very clean. I guess it depends on how it's built. It's also, too, um, how you want that clip to um, proceed. So mm -hmm. right now, if you clip directly down with the 2D shape, it's clipping straight directly down. Now, if the bridge abutments um, and piers go into the pavement a little bit more than you want, it might not be the clip that you are looking for. So... Uh, that's a future enhancement that we're working with tunnels currently because tunnels with service service tunnels along tunnels needs additional clipping capabilities that uh, people are looking for. So that's something to look forward in future releases. Okay. Uh, well, we're out of time. I'm pushing my luck on time here. I'm being uh, – <laughs> so I won't, I won't go there. We may, uh, maybe we'll do an earthwork, a volumes, a quantities session coming up. Maybe I'll schedule that, uh, and we'll just take some time. We'll focus specifically on quantities. We'll look at quantities that are clipped, quantities that are not clipped, what's different between components versus earthwork versus, you know, solids-based uh, type of computations and quantification. Um, I'll put that on my to-do list so that we can spend some time looking specifically at quantities from the 3D model. Because we can't fully, uh, real. We, we just need to focus on that, okay? All right. Thank you all for joining in. Um, I, we got most of the questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get every one of them. Um, we went, the, we, we've gone past the hour, um, and we are limited just on our, our window of time here a little bit. I'll follow up with questions that we didn't respond to today. So be looking for an email from myself or Joe or Dan or Scott. Uh, one of us will, will get back to you. I'll compile these questions, and, and generally it will be me that responds. But uh, thank you for joining in. I hope you found it useful. Uh, we did take up a little more time maybe than I wanted to or had planned on, but, I, again, I hope you found it useful. And as always, we hope you find it beneficial, and we welcome your comments and your feedback. So thank you all for joining in. Catherine, I'll turn it over to you to wrap it up. Joey and all our q assists. Uh, we would now like the participants to take a short poll. Based on today's presentation, would you be interested in having someone contact you to discuss your project needs or schedule a demo? Thank you for everyone's responses. Again, a big thank you to Joey for a great presentation, and a thank you to all of you for your questions and participation. You'll find the link to today's presentation in the follow-up email. Please provide us with feedback on today's webinar by filling out a brief survey, which will be launched at the conclusion of today's session. And remember, if you watch the webinar with a group, you will be able to provide a list of additional participants following the presentation. Thanks again.